Yeah, man. Well, it's good to be back on the radio again today. We certainly do appreciate the good Lord allowing us to be able to come to you by means of radio. This is the Bear Trail Baptist Church broadcast. We certainly are privileged to be the pastor there, Brother Tim Krantz. We are continuing our study in Psalm 27. We're going to continue that today with the help of the Lord. This makes, I think, the fifth sermon in Psalm 27. It appears we still have several to go in this psalm. But we will read several verses in our hearing, maybe through verse number six. And we ended last week's broadcast sort of in a uh, not such a good place. We was talking about our, uh, our confidence in the Lord provides hope. And there's about three points we would like to get to there. And in spite of all the David's trouble, in spite of the enemies, in spite of the war, in spite of the problems, in spite of the battles, David never lost his hope in the Lord. We talked about the fact that a biblical hope is a steadfast, a sure hope. Now, we understand that a physical hope is a hope so or maybe so, or it could or could not, but a biblical hope is a surefire confidence that the Lord is able and that the Lord will. So David had hope in the Lord. So let's pray together. We'll read the verses. And we'll try to continue without repeating a lot of the stuff we mentioned at the end of the last broadcast. Verse number one, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion, in the secret of His tabernacle shall He hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Now, David here, we find that in spite of the Bible talking about enemies and foes in verse number two, talks about a, a host encamped about me in war in verse number three, he talks about his enemies in verse number six. All of these things speak of warfare. But in spite of the battle that is being raged against Dave, David, and it certainly appears to be a difficult situation, in spite of all of that, David's hope remains steadfast in the Lord. He still has hope. Now, so there are several things I want to talk about in, in last, it was on last broadcast, this broadcast, is hope in the midst of our battles. I want to show you from this psalm, from the words of David, why you and I have reason to hope in the Lord. We talked about, or he was in the process of talking about, our confidence in the Lord provides hope. And under that heading, we saw, first of all, that confidence in the, we saw confidence in the person of the Lord. We spoke again of his light and his salvation and his strength that is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we come to this, this second thing, this second thought under the heading of our confidence in the Lord provides hope, and that is confidence in the performance of the Lord. Look at verse number two. It says, when the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, look what happened to them. They stumbled and fell. Verse number three says, though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear, the war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. What a tremendous blessing. David declares that in his, that his present hope in the Lord rests upon that which he has done in the past. God, David said, I've saw David do, the Lord do these things before. The Lord has done great things in my life in the past. It increases my confidence to know that I can continue to have hope in God. He will do it again. God didn't fail him then, and he will not fail you and I today. Amen. Ain't that a blessing? This same confidence, this same hope that David had is the same hope that we can have in our lives today. Why? Because the God that we serve is unchangeable. 
The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he is the same God with the same power that he's always been. He has never and he will never change, amen, because he has been faithful in the past. You and I can count on him being faithful now. Now, you think of, you think of the things that he has done, the victories that he has won, the enemies that he has defeated, the mountains that he has moved, the victories that he's won, and he's done all of this on our behalf, amen. We think of these things and we remember that God has provided countless wonders in the past. We read of those things in the Bible. Obviously, we believe the Bible. We've seen these victories in our own lives. We've heard testimonies of these victories in the lives of individuals that we know and associate with. And so these things should give God's people hope, amen. We ought to have hope. Now, I want you to notice the progression in these verses. Victory in verse number two gives us confidence to fight greater battles and stronger enemies. He said, when the wicked, verse number two, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. And so he's talking about some personal enemies. We have no idea how many, but uh, they are his enemies and his foes. They didn't make it. But notice the progression in verse number three. He said, though an host <laughs> encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. And so listen, the small trial that you may be going through now may be something personal, may not even be anything big enough for other people to notice or other people to see. Maybe those small things in your life now are preparing you for a greater battle, a greater difficulty. I, I, I'm, I'm not wishing these things on you. I'm simply stating that that's the case. David showed that he had confidence in these small victories, these small battles, these, these personal enemies, and they gave him great hope and great confidence in the Lord when there were huge battles to face, when there were great difficulties in his life, when there was a big war that he was facing, his confidence in the Lord provided hope. That's verses 1 through 3. Second of all, our commitment to the Lord provides hope. Verse number four, he said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now, not only does living with our confidence or faith give us hope, but also living faithful to the Lord provides a measure of hope that cannot otherwise exist, amen. David mentions three goals in this verse, and these goals all arise from a single commitment to serve the Lord faithfully from a heart of love. Notice how David's commitment to the Lord manifests itself. Now, so our commitment to the Lord provides hope. First of all, under that heading, David is committed to lingering near the Lord. He said that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. David desires to spend the entirety of his life in the house of the Lord. He wants to be in the place where the Lord dwells. He wants to be the, in the place or in a place where the Lord's presence is real. The psalmist said in Psalm 84 and verse, verse number 4, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Selah. David has a desire to be where God is. He has a desire to be in the place where God is worshipped. He has a, place, a desire to be in the place where, where God is praised, amen. That is, his very heartbeat is to be in the place where God is honored. Listen, that ought to be the, our will as well as it was David's will. We need to have that same passion to be where the Lord is honored, to be where the Lord is worshipped. Now, Obviously, of course, we have the church and we are commanded to be faithful in our attendance, uh, a meeting together with, with believers, assembled together with believers. We're commanded to do that. And I, I think there ought to also be a, a desire in our heart to find a place of closeness and intimacy with the Lord. Um, we can have that place where we can linger in his presence all the days of our life. Listen, there could very well come a time in your life when you are no longer physically able to assemble yourself 
uh, with like-minded believers. I hope that there's a place in your heart where you can faithfully and uh, reverently worship God and, and, and not get separated from, from the things of God and the, the life that God would be honored with you living, amen. If there is a genuine desire in your heart to be near the Lord, it will manifest itself in clear action. While you have ability, while you have the health, while there is availability, you will have a desire to be present with God's people. You will have a desire to assemble yourself with God's people. There will be a commitment in your heart to pray. There will be a commitment in your heart to have a desire for the Word of God, to study the Word of God. There will be a commitment to private as well as public worship. And um, there will just be a desire in your heart to be one with God, to be in fellowship with God. You'll want to be able to linger near where he is at, and you'll find a way to do so. Now, I like this. When we make a move towards God, he'll make a move towards us. The Bible says in James 4, verse number 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. If there seems to be, or if you seem in your heart to be a guilty distance from God, friend, that doesn't have to be the case. I'm glad if we will draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from our sin. And he's faithful and just to cleanse us from our How does that verse go? I forgot the verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sorry about that. I finally figured it out. My mind is not what it used to be. I used to have a, a good mind, but I can't find it now. And so David here, we find that he, his commitment to the Lord provides hope. He's committed to lingering near the Lord. He is committed to loving the Lord. Now notice why David wants to be faithful to the things of the Lord. David wants to behold the beauty of the Lord. Now you and I that have any Bible knowledge at all, we know that the Bible says in Isaiah 53 and verse number 1, it says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now we know that this truth in the scripture, there's no physical beauty to the Lord Jesus Christ that we should desire him. And yet David wants to behold the beauty of the Lord. How is that the case? Well, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29 says this, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord, listen to this, in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 29, verse number two says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 60, 96, and verse number nine says, oh, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. So it is very clear from Scripture what makes the Lord beautiful is his holiness. It is the fact that he is without sin that makes the Lord so beautiful, amen. Now, when you and I, we look upon Christ, we, we behold his beaten body. We behold his bruised body. We, uh, we behold the, the, the scars and the crown of thorns and the wounds in his side and his hands and his feet. And there is certainly no beauty that we see in that horrendous beating and mutilation of the flesh. But it's beautiful because we know why he willingly, willingly received those those wounds, and that's because he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. It was in that broken body that he took our sin upon himself. So to you and I, that is the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the beauty of his holiness, amen. I'll give you an example of that. If there was a building fire and my grandson were to be hopelessly trapped inside of that burning building with no way to escape, some stranger or friend or passerby, whatever the case may have been, rushed into that building risking his own life to save the life of my grandson. And in, and in his, his, or his, uh, uh, his efforts to save our, his heroic efforts to save our grandson, he, he becomes horribly disfigured because 
the fire that ravishes his body and scars his body and, and burns the tissue of his skin. Others may look upon him as some kind of monster because of his wounds. But to myself and those who loved my grandson, the appearance of that man would be beautiful because he risked his life to save the precious life of my grandson. You see, friend, that's how we see the beauty of the Lord. That's how we behold the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. He placed himself in harm's way. He he allowed himself to be mutilated so that he might be our sacrifice for sin. What a great blessing. And so we see that we, David, was committed to lingering near the Lord. He was committed to loving the Lord. He was committed to leaning on the Lord. We're still in verse number four. He said, one thing of I desire to the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord and, and to inquire in his temple. So he's committed to leaning on the Lord. David also expresses his desire to call upon the Lord, to commune with God, to make requests of God. This is another image of worship, if you will. David here declares his utter dependence upon the Lord for the necessities of life. David looks beyond his own ability and he sees the limitless provisions that are offered by the Lord himself Therefore, he wants nothing more than to be able to call upon the Lord and to inquire in his temple. My, what a limitless resource that is given to you and I in prayer. Listen, we are invited to pray. Jeremiah 33 and verse number three, the Bible says, Call unto me and I will answer thee and shew thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You and I are promised that God will not just hear our prayers, but that God will answer our prayers. It is no wonder that David wanted to be near the the temple. And while he was in that temple, he wasn't wasting his time. He's inquiring of the Lord himself. The Bible says in Isaiah 65 and verse 24, And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. John 14, 3, the Bible says, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Listen, friend, you and I should learn to lean upon him. Instead of worry, instead of fear, Instead of dodging and hiding from the enemies, let us learn to turn to the Lord. And so our confidence in the Lord provides hope. Our commitment to the Lord provides hope. Third of all, our comfort in the Lord provides hope. Look at verse number five. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Listen, first of all, God has a sheltered place for us. This is the first one under the heading of our comfort in the Lord provides hope. God has a sheltered place for us. Notice he said in verse number five, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. David tells us that the Lord will hide him in his pavilion. Now, think about this. A king's pavilion was a tent that was erected in the center of the army's encampment. And the tent was then surrounded by an army of brave soldiers with all the hosts of the army camped around about them The king's pavilion was the safest place on the battlefield. Those who were fortunate enough to be allowed to enter the king's pavilion were were protected by the soldiers and they were entertained by the king during the battle. In fact, the word hide here, for in the time of trouble thou shalt hide me in his pavilion. The word hide here means to treasure away. Aren't you glad that the Lord treasures us away? from our enemies, our trials, our troubles. It's not that we don't have them. It's that we can safely trust God to deliver us from them. Amen. Now, as the battle of life rages us, rages against us, 
we are safely tucked away in the king's pavilion. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 3, listen to this, your life is hid with Christ in God. Can I tell you something? There's not a safer place in all the universe than knowing that your life is hid with Christ in God. So those who have entered his pavilion are protected by him, and even while the battles rage around him, amen, they are entertained with the peace and the joy that only the king himself can provide, amen. What a blessing. This is the promise to those who abide in that close place. No enemy can penetrate the defenses and enter that private place. It is protected from the enemy. So our confidence in the Lord provides hope. God is a sheltered place for us. God is a secret place for us. Notice that verse number five goes on to say, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. Now the word tabernacle brings to mind the place of worship. The secret refers to the holy of holies. This place was certainly off limits to all but the high priest. And he could only enter there one day per year, and only with the blood of an innocent sacrifice could he do that. It was a place that other men entered under the penalty of death. It is a place where we can, however today, it is a place where we can enter boldly because of the sacrifice of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It is amazing that there is a place of solitude in a world filled with people. There is a place that you and I can flee to during the crushing battles that rage about us. It's a, a place that affords us quiet, peace, and profound presence with God and of God. Stephen was in a place at that moment of his death. Even though there was a lot of folks around about him, they were mocking and ridiculing and stoning him. The Bible says this in Acts 7, 55, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He, did, he got his eyes off of his enemy that was around him. He looked up and when he looked up, he no longer saw his enemies. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Listen, as the battles of this life crash about us, and as our enemies cast their rocks and their words against us, you and I should take our eyes off of the immediate enemy and look steadfastly into heaven to the glory of God, and we can see Jesus seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for you and I. What a tremendous blessing. Paul was at this place in his life. In Acts chapter 27 and verse 21, the Bible says, But after long absence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and says, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve. Man, they were in a battle. They were in a storm that absolutely destroyed the entire ship, but not a single one of them lost their life. You know why? Because they were tucked safely in God's pavilion. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 12 says this in verse number one. It is not expedient for me doubt. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one called up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was called up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Did you know it is possible for us to enter that sacred, secret place where the world just seems to dim away and, be, and God becomes larger than anything else around us. My, my, I long for those secret places and secret moments of intimacy and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, our comfort in the Lord provides hope. God has a shelter 
place, sheltered place for us. God has a secret place for us. God has a secure place for us. Notice also verse number five, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion and the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. Notice the last part. He shall set me upon a rock. David has assurance that even when life threatens to overflow him, when his enemies are threatening to swallow him up, the Lord will set him on a rock. Listen, I, I like this being set up on a rock. It's unchangeable. It's powerful. It's immovable. And of course, the rock that David is referring to is the Lord himself. David said in Psalm 41, it's 40 verse number one, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established, and established my goings. Listen, God wants to take you out of that horrible pit and set you on a solid rock. Now there's something I want you to notice here in this verse number five. I just read it again, the passive nature of, of the, all the things that are mentioned here in verse number five, all of the things that David mentions are not things that he does to himself. They are all things that are done to him by the Lord. Do you know that the believer is required to do nothing but be in a close fellowship, close relationship to the Lord? These things are done by the Lord for his child. Look what it says, verse five. I want to read it again with that thought in your mind. For in the time of trouble... He shall hide me. I'm not hiding myself. He shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He's going to hide me in the secret of his tabernacle, amen. He, not me, I didn't climb up there. I didn't, I didn't try to get up there on the rock. He shall set me up on a rock. I'm glad that God takes care of his own, amen. What a blessing to know that the Lord will take care of his own. Now, lastly, under this thought, God has a special place for us. Verse number six. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. So David says that he will worship the Lord. He will praise the Lord because of the things that the Lord has done for him. Because the Lord has hid him away safely. Because the Lord has lifted him up above his enemies. Because the Lord has taken him out of a sinking place and placed him upon a solid place. Because God has sheltered him. David says, I will in turn, I will offer a sacrifice of joy Man, what a blessing it would be if some, God, if some of God's children, if some believers in the Lord Jesus Christ would actually express some joy about the fact that they know the Lord is their Savior. David expressed that joy by singing, yea, singing praises to the Lord. Listen, this is a great blessing. This is a great lesson for you and I. The Lord delivers us. The Lord sets us in a high place above our enemies we shouldn't be there to gloat. We shouldn't be there in pride in that position. We should be singing praises unto our great God for his deliverance. Now listen, here's my conclusion for today. Are you fighting some battles today? <laughs> There's no doubt. Of course you are. But in the midst of your battles, do you have hope? Do you have a deep, settled confidence that everything is going to be all right? If you do, praise the Lord. It's because of him that you do, for he is worthy to be praised. But listen, if you lack that hope, if you lack that confidence, put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is he alone who is able to hide you in his pavilion, who is able to lift you and place you upon the rock. Man, it, it, it is thrown by the Lord Jesus Christ. He has all the comfort and all the peace that we need, God help us to depend upon Him. Our time is quickly coming on again today. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Baritual Baptist Church broadcast. May God bless you till we meet again is our prayer. Thank you for watching on social media. Please like and share the broadcast for us. We sure would appreciate that. God bless you. Good day.